Hi, uh, hey everyone. Welcome to what's the third live session for this course. If you've had a chance to look through some of the discussions and some of the material over the last few weeks, I think there's a fair bit that has been going on. I know during the last live session, I believe that was uh, Justin and Matt. I don't know if Negan was able to make that one, but nonetheless, um, there's been a lot going on in the course. If you consider where we were at, uh, just by way of a really brief run through. So one of the first things that we started really was to focus on what does this transition mean and what might you want to be aware of? And so we focused on sort of a quick orientation to just getting started. And then we, uh, in our first module, we really looked at what does it mean to move online? What are some of the things that you want to be conscious of? What, what's different about the experience? Because it's not just moving into a different environment. It's about changing a range of your practices. Uh, in the second module, there's more of an emphasis on some of the aspects related to content creation and what content creation entails or involves at least is uh, how do you take what you've done perhaps in a classroom with lecture notes or within class activities and try and somewhat duplicate that online without making it essentially just a reduction to Zoom teaching, which is the last thing you wanna do. Um, now we're transitioning a bit more into some of the aspects around interaction and fostering and promoting interaction in ways that you can improve the quality of the student's experience from that end. And so obviously uh, this is a topic area that um, you know, people on the, on the call here, uh, Tanya and, and Matt in particular, have some extensive experience on. And so maybe I'll start by throwing it out to, to Tanya just to sort of share what you've observed either with the course or with the course content or something that struck you as interesting in Q&A or, or related uh, discussions within the course or broadly on the, the big old happy internet? Yeah, well, I think that we have uh, a great group and a lot of people have a lot of good ideas. And so it's nice to hear what folks are thinking. I'm learning a lot because I don't have any experience in K-12 necessarily although I've sat on different advisory boards um, statewide and nationally. So I'm learning a lot as well. One of the questions that came up, and I'm guessing Matt probably has some expertise in this area, or you, George, but there was um, a lot of information or a lot of questions being asked about facilitating online discussions. And so um, I was sort of contemplating, you know, um, and also I've watched my uh, sixth grader, now going to be seventh grader, uh, with her online experience, you know, which was an on the fly. Um, I don't even know if you would call that learning what they were doing the last few weeks, but there was some structure. They did have a Google Classroom and so forth. So, um, you know, we're used to, or I'm used to in my courses, creating very structured activities for asynchronous discussions, but I was wondering if you guys had any input on for K-12 um, what are some tips or um, some guidelines or some help that folks can have for facilitating discussions? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And uh, Matt, I'm looking at you and I'm going to throw the ball your way. I know you've got uh, a, a lot of experience in uh, designing for learning online and designing for interaction. I think that's been a big part of the approach that you've taken is fostering and promoting uh, that level of engagement and interaction. And I think you also have... Uh, unless I'm like way off base, I know Justin does, but I thought you also had some experience within the K to 12 system as well. And um, so what are your thoughts from your experience around trying to promote discussions online in generally and targeting that more towards the K to 12 sector? Because I know you've got a young and that's uh, going through some of the joys of the Texas schooling system as well. Well, if you could put the discussion forums in Fortnite, uh, he would never leave them uh, because he discovered that two months ago and I, I forgot what he looks like because I haven't seen him. Um, no, he actually, he actually pulled me in to try and play Fortnite too, which I'm not good at, but I'm learning at least. Um, and my, my K-12 experience was face-to-face -face and my online learning design experiences in college, you know, university level. So, I don't know, it just seems as students, as students get younger and younger, I'm not sure about the, the asynchronous discussion for them, especially when there's, they're learning how to write, they're learning how to read still, um, and especially if they come back from uh, this summer where there's all this ambiguity about what's gonna even happen for the fall and they haven't necessarily been keeping up 
with their reading and writing skills as much as we like to pretend like we are doing that with our students. Uh, with our own children, we're not necessarily as well. So um, I, I'm not really sure if I would recommend discussion forums uh, younger than maybe ninth grade, maybe eighth grade, depending on what the topic is or, or something like that. Um, because especially too, you're going to have to look at a situation where they're going to have to be heavily moderated. Um, and you're going to have to look out for students that want to bring some of the face-to-face -face bullying and uh, discrimination online in the discussion forums. So um, you may be getting into a situation where, um, you know, we already have so many Zoom meetings as it is, but I think I, I may, might suggest people use, even though they're trying to use less synchronous time because we're all getting burned out on Zoom, maybe spend that time uh, for the discussions in the, you know, maybe high school years or, or even if sometimes they somewhat did a discussion with my son and it worked fairly well, but again, it was heavily moderated by three teachers who did, who, uh, it, you know, they, they got all three of the uh, fourth grade teachers on at the same time and they set each class on at a different time, but all three of the teachers were moderating for each, you know, 30 minute session. Um, so it might be a better use of the, of the synchronous Zoom time to actually facilitate some of those interactions and discussions rather than uh, the, the, you know, kind of lecture teaching part. I don't know. Though. I was talking to some K-12 um, educators and I didn't realize how important the, they call it online citizenship is. So um, like my, um, my daughter's first um, online class, which I attended was just, the kids were so excited to see each other. They were just yelling, um, you know, in the synchronous thing, like, yeah, while one was probably playing Fortnite, like ah, yelling at his like game. And, um, and it was a uh, total craziness. And then later, like she switched to a different platform that like this allowed her to mute everyone. There was a second teacher. So there's definitely um, a coordination effort. I think when you're synchronous, I think also there's, um, you know, some sort of how do you behave when we're in this virtual online classroom? Um, and these were, well, she's in a classroom that's fourth through sixth graders. It's Montessori. But yeah, it was very interesting. And I don't know how they would make asynchronous discussions happen. Although um, some of the students, as it progressed, they sort of learned the, I mean, you know, we've all been naturally in the face-to-face -face for a very long time. So just like when our college classes go online, it takes some getting used to, you know, for children in K-12, I think it's the same thing. But I definitely would um, rethink my advice for online discussions um, specific to the K-12 audience to probably look for more asynchronous constructive um, interactions that are facilitated with, uh, with guidelines. Then I would encourage uh, folks to do the asynchronous discussion threads. At the same time, my daughter's been in virtual worlds for a while now and she's definitely increased her um, you know, ability to communicate in writing with chat um, and those sorts of things. And I do see her classmates and the way they're organizing it, they are doing back channel communication. So I think there's um, some different ways with that. But anyways, I just was sort of um, uh, really, um, and two, I wasn't even thinking about the fact that students are bullying other students in these online realms. Um, and so that's another thing about the online citizenship. So anyways, I feel like I've been learning a little something in the past couple of weeks about this as well. Yeah, and I think an interesting point that Matt raised, uh, which is worth emphasizing, is that when students in a university sector begin to transition or pivot into online learning, they often have an established base of knowledge uh, around writing, writing skills, writing mechanisms, and so on. Uh, they're often a little further along in terms of their ability uh, or the way that they've been taught to sort of form and ideas, concepts, share them with others, and then engage in some kind of an interactive way. In fact, the entire community of inquiry model that underpins a good portion of what we're doing in this course 
has this viewpoint that, and Terry Anderson calls it uh, sort of the, this, uh, the equivalency theorem, which is this view that you've got three domains of interaction. It's interactions with content, interactions with peers, and interactions with the teacher. Now, if any two of those are sufficiently developed and designed properly, that you may not need the third, which means if you have quality interaction with content and quality interaction with peers, you might be all right you'll learn. Now the difference comes in that there is a significant variation in online settings for younger students because the there's a lot of modeling and developmental attributes that comes by as a consequence of the actions that the teacher undertakes in a class setting. So it's you're, you're not just learning the knowledge of the course, you're learning the becoming of a person. And I think that makes it much more difficult, especially with younger populations. And you might, a group of say first year undergrads, you might be able to say, all right, I'd like you to spend some time talking about whatever topic is, is relevant in the news they can go through the discussion process because they've developed those mechanisms at least at a minimal level. You do that with a group of children in grade five or six. Uh, the, the language skills are not necessarily fully developed. The, some of the social cues and mechanisms haven't been you know, quite refined, even though many of them spend more time chatting, texting, and communicating with their small peer group in a social system. But how to do that across people who have different views, perspectives, uh, may, may be less developed. So uh, I'd love to see if anyone's familiar with some of the literature that addresses the application of the developmental component of being a person for younger students in contrast with what happens in the university sector. Um, so I'm going to go to the discussion area that's asked is, you know, what would be your tips for online discussions for 20 to 25 year olds who are ESL, sort of intermediate learners? Either of you want to tackle uh, ESL instruction in online forums and how to promote discussions? Um, well, I think it depends on what they're learning. I've worked with several people and one of the folks on my staff used to be um, an ESL teacher. And, um, you know, I think that asynchronous discussions can be great. I think that it depends on your LMS. Um, if you're doing auditory um, or, um, you know, oral communication and those sorts of things, there's a uh, different LMS. I'm not sure if it's all of them, maybe you guys know. Um, but some of them have where you can actually have voice, more or less a voice or audio recorded um, exchanges with folks. So I think that's really helpful. I know sometimes when you're translating or learning English as a second language, writing it out um, in English might be easier than saying it in English or, um, you know, depending on what you're doing. But some of the new discussion, asynchronous discussion forums have that audio recording, which I think is really helpful. Um, and then there's also third party tools like VoiceThread um, and those sorts of things that you can use as well. But I think a lot of ESL instructors, and I think there's um, actually several um, in this course. And so um, it would, you know, it might be a great um, conversation to deeper in the asynchronous discussion forums and the edX so you can connect with each other about different ideas with that. But um, a lot of ESL, um, faculty and instructors talk about the benefits of online because of the fact that there's sort of that anonymity. Um, you can use different modes uh, to communicate, and so there's a little bit more of confidence building there and so forth. Um, Matt, I'm not sure if you have any experience with that. Uh, you know, I got my ESL certification like years before I was even online <laughs> and then never used it since then. So it's been a long time since I looked at ESL specifically. Um, for intermediate learners, though, I, I would think it'd be massively different than how you would set it up for any other learner, especially in a college age group, because uh, there's at an intermediate level, there's, a, there's enough uh, you know, knowledge there to, to communicate in English. Um, uh, you know, if, if you have some kind of minimum requirement for 500 words or something, that would probably be very stressful for an ESL learner. And so I, I'd get away from those, those you know, uh, those, those, those certain uh, scenarios where people require a certain number of words 
but because you're looking to get someone that has intermediate knowledge and they, that, might, uh, that might be very stressful for them, especially if it, if it gets into the hundreds of words. That would be the main thing I would say uh, for that, especially if you're looking for it to keep it asynchronous and text-based, you know. Um, other, otherwise, I think that you could use a lot of the same um, uh, methods as you would use for other learners as well. One of the interesting aspects too is the, especially around language, there's such a significant amount of resources that are available outside of the structured environments that we create. And with my own interest in network learning, it's how do you take students and not, you know, especially at the 2025 year group where some of the issues with younger student populations around ethics and privacy and security are little, little less diminished. But how do you take these, these students and not have yourself as the instructor be the only node that they're exposed to with the range of, of language tools that are now available with the ability for our students to learn through any of the open online courses or YouTube or other areas. There's a lot more that can be done for students to interact with others in reasonably authentic ways, especially certain language apps that have you teach others while you're involved in, in learning. So you may teach in a language that you're trying to learn, or you may teach in your native language while you receive the benefit of someone else teaching. So I'm trying to get at with that is the interactions don't need to be exclusively the domain of the educator and monitoring of the educator at that age, you can also network them or give them opportunities to be more broadly uh, engaged with other language based or ESL communities. Uh, William throws out a question which said, is it okay for me to apply this course to my uh, profession as a product trainer, not necessarily academia? Uh, my reaction is absolutely, because anytime you're involved in a process where you need to communicate something to someone, whether it's you as a teacher who wants to communicate and teach, if you will, how uh, to do you know, something within a particular subject like math or history or uh, whatever it is that, that you're teaching, or whether you're trying to teach someone to use a product or service, it's, it's many of the processes are comparable. The one difference, though, obviously, in a corporate setting as a product trainer is uh, there, there can be issues where, where when you move into networks, you lose the ability to control the narrative in many ways. Uh, you open it up for others to sort of own or be involved and move things in a different direction that you didn't anticipate. That's one of the natural byproducts of learning or engaging in a network system. Um, any other thoughts from either of you on this one? No, I totally agree. Something do you want to share more, Tan? <laughs> yeah, do you want to share more about uh, the idea of uh, group learning? Because one of the first things that the internet did that really drove interest across broad populations, and this was with the bulletin boards way back when, is it enabled people who in their own region, there might be one of them, if you will, uh, let's say one of them could be anything. It could be your political interests. It could be your romantic interests. Like who knows what? It could be the hobbies you're engaged in. I remember this when I was at Red River College. There was roughly me interested in what you might be able to do with technology. I found in online spaces the ability to connect with a huge number of people distributed outside of my professional network that were tremendously helpful in teaching me about what could be done and was available with technology. So the ability to be connected is the ability to move a classroom at a global level or at a broader level, at least. So when you talk about group learning, uh, what does that mean to you? And what might someone in a younger group like K to 12 take away from that? Um, so I just feel like group learning is like the theme. Um, I think we chatted a couple of weeks ago and I feel like um, in my, you know how like topics just keep coming up. Um, topics just keep coming up and that's one of them. And so I'll explain a couple stories. So um, the National Humanities Center has asked me to come and participate in their summer institute, which for the first time is online. I think they have like 70 or 80 graduate students. And again, um, as a lot of us have figured out in online, like the real key to it is to 
Um, it's not necessarily even figuring out the tools or figuring out the content. It's figuring out that engagement interaction piece um, and the, the presence piece. And so if you can figure out sort of that, I feel like that's a, that's a real key. And so one of the things they'd asked me was sort of we were talking through was, you know, they're trying to give the students rather than just um, presentation after presentation, you know, what else could we do? And so we talked um, a little bit about sort of using um, a flipped model with asynchronous and synchronous. So they're gonna, um, very similar to what you all are doing in module three, they'll read about groups, develop an activity and so forth, and then we'll come together synchronously um, and sort of um, talk about, um, you know, different uh, considerations and developing group activities and facilitating those in the class. And so I thought that was, um, you know, an interesting way to do it online um, in sort of a blended format when you're thinking of modality as not just online and face to face, but also asynchronous and synchronous. Um, so a way that you can have your students do something for a week and then come together synchronously and catch up. I also had another colleague um, from ASU actually who DM'd me on Twitter and was like, Tanya, I have a thousand, um, you know, um, economies, a thousand economy students. I hate economists. A thousand economy students. I'm just kidding, a little. And, um, you know, what do I do with them? We, we get to go whatever we want. You know, everyone, it seems now you can go face to face. I don't even know, face to face, blended, hybrid, high flex, some combination, throw them in a mixer and um, throw it on the wall and see what you come up with. Everyone's got lots of different ways they're possibly able to teach in the fall. And, um, you know, it was split right down the middle. Half of the students really wanted online because they feel like, and half the people wanted, uh, half the students wanted face, or um, half students wanted face-to-face, -face, half wanted online. The students who wanted face-to-face -face said they're having a problem engaging, you know, with online lectures and that sort of thing. Um, and, and it also came up in another area. And so um, just this idea, this is not new, this is, you know, decades old, which is a putting students together in, um, especially if there might be an on-campus presence or not, putting them in sort of work groups, you know? And I've mentioned um, the Michelson book before, but the idea of putting students in like groups of four to five, um, you have a thousand students. I've done it with a large lecture of 400 before. Um, and so that way the students can meet every week. They have a group of peers they could even meet on campus if they want, um, you know, to still engage, but it allows them a quick connection with a group of people that can help them um, digest the content that they can have conversations with that they could potentially still get that face to face without having um, to violate any of the CDC guidelines that we have here in the US about coming together. Um, and so I know the other countries, I'm not sure what you all have, but in the US, um, we've had some pretty um, interesting requirements for the CDC for bringing classes together, um, such as one door in, one door out, um, the spacing between students, the size of students. I think the capacity of the rooms are cut down to 25%. I, oh, I might be getting that wrong. Um, I am not working on this personally, so I'm not an expert in the CDC guidelines for face-to-face -face learning. Uh, but it's very interesting. So I think by putting students in groups and using more hybrid models, again, it gives you this like opportunity that if students want to meet face to face, which I've had in my fully online classes, um, students will still go um, and meet face to face in the library or in the union and those sorts of things. So anyways, um, I just feel like more and more um, as you're rethinking your courses for the fall, it, for several reasons, give your students an opportunity to at least have a lifeline and be connected to, um, you know, four or five other students. And that way they can get support in a multitude of ways. And we're not even touching on the social emotional um, sorts of support. One of the things my daughter's teacher did not do is she didn't put them in smaller groups. Um, and normally when they work even in the physical classroom, because it's Montessori education, they tend to work in smaller groups. Um, they don't have desks. It's a 
it's a very um, active, uh, student-centered active learning space. And I'm just wondering if groups wouldn't even be um, a more effective way as well in the K through 12 um, sector to start designing your learning so that students can help each other with technology, they can help each other with just the cognitive piece of learning the content, and they can help each other with social emotional challenges that they might be going through because, you know, five months into it, this is rough. So anyways, I'll get off my soapbox now, but I'm totally into groups lately. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things you'll you'll see as well if you've looked, worked through through the the curriculum for the week, uh, we we've got a couple of different interviews. There's one that uh, Dragon Gasovich uh, has where he talks specifically about this relationship between self regulation, which is sort of critical. Like we 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 need to develop our self regulatory capability because the self regulation skills of individuals as you know, as young as, you know, great levels, uh, you know, four five and six can actually be indicative of a number of things such as their happiness when they're adults, things like their credit rating and a number of things. So self-regulation is a key skill. However, increasingly in a world that's getting ridiculously complex and interconnected, that self-regulation occurs within community and within relationships to others. And so Dragon starts to talk about the community of inquiry model as well, is what does it mean to not only be strong in your self-regulatory capability, but also to be able to connect and intersect with other people in the process of learning, inter or solving complex problems or anything along those lines. Um, so so you, you may want to particularly pay attention to, to that uh, interview with Dragon and some of the aspects that, he, that we address in that conversation. The other thing uh, I want to raise as well, we have a number of activities listed in this module on things that you can get going or things that you can start to have students be involved in their interactions with with one another so there whether it's just simple icebreakers it's simple activities to get just to sort of socialize or get people into those social settings now the other component that's critical there is recognizing that developing social skills to interact with others and to learn in groups is not an on and off switch. It requires developmental approaches, which means you start by low level introductions. You add additional, more complex activities. You uh, have scaffolds in place that promote the kinds of group learning behavior that you want to see in the population. And you need to mirror, model, regulate the kinds of activities that are going on, especially with, with younger students. Uh, let's see, do we have any oh, questions? About younger students. Oh, sorry, George. But I just was talking with somebody too that's teaching. Um, I feel like I should be like the um, faculty therapist or something. <laughs> you know, everyone's got questions and looking for advice. But another colleague was asking me last night about a graduate course that he's teaching, um, actually in instructional design and how um, trying to teach instructional designers writing. And I think some of those exact same things that you talk about, George, are just as relevant as they are for a sixth grader as they are for somebody who's in grad school. Um, I think that, and we're talking about it a little bit in the chat here, um, and, and too, I've studied group processes a lot, but you know, we have to give groups um, an opportunity to bond with each other. They have to establish some sort of trust. They have to get to know each other a little bit. They have to do some norming, although I hate that word, um, but that sort of piece with it. Um, I think if we've talked about, there also has to be expectations for their activities in the groups. So, um, you know, whether you're teaching them how to write or you're teaching them English as a second language or um, whatever that they're doing, um, you know, at some sort of temporal framework, you know, every week or every other week or so forth, it's good to have them produce some sort of documentation or evidence of um, what they've done in that amount of time or what they've learned. Um, so like I have project teams where they're sort of producing something that's very similar to what they would do in the corporate world. Um, but also I have them doing writing assignments. And so um, you know, every couple of weeks, they're giving you a piece of that um, writing assignment as well, or they're giving you a piece of just um, what they would do, let's say, in a project team, like, 
here's our meeting minutes for the next two weeks. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, I, I, again, just love groups. And I think that from um, a faculty perspective too, it minimizes your grading if you structure them correctly and so forth. So instead of, you know, having to grade, um, you know, 25 or 1000 um, papers, you're, you know, grading, um, you know, 20% of that. I think also um, when you think about the reports that you're getting, the number one things that employers will say often is that students don't know how to work in groups um, or they're difficult to work in groups, um, especially in some of like the STEM areas and so forth. So anyways, I think there's lots of, lots of advantages there. <laughs> and and so go uh, use groups now. <laughs> Do it immediately. Well, and I think the other thing too, you, you see this already, even, even here, you know, there's some discussion happening in the forums, which is just a, a surface level illustration of, of uh, this idea that peers can be teachers. And that, that's uh, the first section of the content this week. We, we introduce like, look, when you go into networks, you're dealing with a structurally different environment. There's a lot of literature out there that as we've articulated, says, you know what, online learning, in-classroom learning, they produce comparable results. Uh, and increasingly, it's blended learning and, and the one drawback of COVID, it's lasting damage to the education sector will be the generation of a mess of new buzzwords like high flex and other crazy crap. But um, the, the reality I think is when you move into this setting, you're dealing with a structurally different relationship with your students. That, that's foundational. And the harder you try to use traditional techniques for control, the more misaligned you'll be with the attributes of the medium, which means you can't go out and, and uh, mandate things the way that you might be able to do in a classroom because students will back channel. You can teach and they'll, they'll have, uh, you know, whatever they're using for a back channel, whether it is something like Minecraft or whether it's Discord or whatever they got going on, they're going to be talking to one another. Uh, so networks shift control and influence. It requires a completely different approach for teaching in that environment. I think if there's anything you get away from this course, it's that it's not that the online environment is worse or better. It's that it's different and you need to act differently in this environment to produce the intended or sort of optimal outcomes that you want with, with your students. Um, so with that as a little bit of a background, the importance of uh, content and interactions and group-based learning and the need for scaffolding, people aren't naturally good group learners that has to be modeled and promoted and so on. Um, I want to talk a little bit more now about the ways that researchers can use, or not researchers, teachers can use environments outside of their controlled space. So even in a course where you're using Blackboard or Canvas, uh, you, you already have a bit of a network shift, but you still control the discussion environment. But students also have easy access to get out and interact with others in different areas. What's the impact of using that space and broadening interactions outside of the course and outside of the particular class that you're engaging with. Do you have thoughts on that, Matt? Considering the K-12 sector has some privacy issues and uh, security issues that we don't necessarily face in higher education? If I think this would be a K-12 discussion, I might have uh, had a longer nap or something and actually missed it. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, um, I mean, in the K-12 environment, if, if you want to lose your job, sure, go outside the tools that, that they give you. I mean, there's just, there's, um, gosh, I mean, when I taught eighth grade science and I tried to use uh, websites outside of the few that they had approved for it, it was just like I had opened up the gates of hell and asked demons to come into the classroom. I mean, it was, it was just, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's the, the K-12 environment is just really hard to, to do that. I mean, and there are some school districts that are a little more lenient on that, and they will, um, um, and they and, and they will approve these external tools if you submit to them. You know, submit to this process and um, and um, and prove that you're not going to let students, you know. Uh, uh, steal their parents' credit card or whatever and buy V-Bucks or something. But, you know, it's, uh, 
it's very heavily regulated in, in K-12, so I, I'm not sure, I, you know, and again, that's something I haven't had experience with in a long time, so I'm not even sure where the current uh, trends are with that, unfortunately. Yeah, and maybe for anybody who's in the, in the course here, I, either raise your hand and we'll give you the mic, but that's using um, sort of environments that are on the wild web versus the closed spaces. I think, you know, Matt is, is paying on. There's such a challenge of complete control loss. You move to networks in a classroom, you already lose some control by students becoming peer teachers. On the flip side, you move to the open web and you lose in many ways a lot more control. And, and so that presents a range of challenges. So if anybody wants to raise their hand and uh, you know, address that, that, that'd be great. Uh, or just provide comments in it from how, what you do to be successful in that area. Uh, any thoughts from your end, Tanya? Yeah, again, recently, um, just talking with some K-12 educators about their experience online, um, like Matt had talked about, um, you know, having secure sites, I guess, is a big thing. Um, um, knowing that um, you have to be, you know, you can't have students just Google something. Uh, it's like, you know, they're so concerned about how, you know, it's like that extra burden of proof when technology is involved. Like, do you know every ad they're going to get and everything they're going to see while they're out there in the wild west called the, wild, the web? I'm obviously as a parent, like the opposite. Like, let's talk about when you go into a room and there's something you don't like, you leave. <laughs> um, I don't think we could shelter and control the world from our, our kids. But um, the other thing that was interesting is, um, when you're at home, you know, students are at home because previously um, I did work with social media and how social media could be used as um, as a um, addendum, you know, a space where students connect and those sorts of things in particular because we tend to use archaic communication students to connect with students when, um, you know, they weren't using those. And so, um, you know, in K-12, especially in certain school districts, like um, in the Milwaukee Public School District where I'm at, because security is such an issue, everything is locked down. There is no YouTube. Um, there is no um, anything. There is such a small, uh, and the CIO, you know, gets to decide, not the teachers, what the small set of approved sites are that are, um, and even teachers can't even access sites to get information and so forth. Um, now when you're, so I think for teachers, it's extra difficult because now the students are at home, um, they do have broader access, so it can offer some opportunities, but then again, it can um, create some liabilities as well. So um, I think there's definitely a balance there. I think um, to what you were saying, George, though, we have to be careful and going online because we're uh, it's unknown and it's new and there's novelty. So we try to control it more. Um, and that's not always the case. As I chatted here, you know, when my daughter's um, students class, which I'm totally like a social scientist, like in the background, like writing notes, observing them because it's uh, so interesting. Um, and so, you know, it's like um, at some point, all of the like, 80% of the students all shut their cameras off. They were just listening to the teacher. They were all back cha channeling, um, you know, on their iPhones through like a group message thing. So they were connecting and they were talking about things. As George said, they're gonna switch the power over to somewhere they feel more comfortable having those conversations. And so I think you need to think about that. I would assume it's the same thing with college students. I don't do a lot of synchronous sessions um, very rarely. Um, with um, students, but I would assume that they're back channeling as well. What I always like to advocate for is to build in the back channeling into the pedagogical activity itself. So encourage students to back channel and um, connect with each other. So anyways, those are my thoughts. <laughs> so Gabby had just brought up how big should a group discussion be? And um, I tend to, in the literature, and they talk about group size, just in, um, in general, communication and organizations and um, in education as well, it really depends on the task um, or the activity. 
So if you're looking for them to brainstorm, stimulate discussion, share ideas, you would want a larger number. Um, if you're looking for them to collaboratively work together to produce a product or work on a project together, probably a smaller number. Um, the literature um, that goes back is usually from four to nine. Um, for face-to-face, -face, they face four to six. Um, when you are um, online, I would push that up a little because some students will not show up. They'll drift off into cyberspace. So I try to lean towards the at least six in a group for project teams, or at least that's been my experience, and that tends to be safe. If you start getting too many in project teams, um, some people will definitely be um, the loafers and won't do work and, and those sorts of things. Um, and so I'm, when you're breaking them into discussion groups, though, I like them to be larger, um, you know, in groups of 15, maybe. Um, if I have a class of 25 or 30, I usually don't break them down. Only when I have um, large online classes of like 50 or 100 or 150. You guys have any um, strategies you use? I'll throw that over to Matt. Um, those are mostly the same strategies I would use um, as well. Uh, there are also group activities where you're looking more at a role play scenario type situation or some kind of problem based learning uh, where different people have different roles. And so you want to look at the, the groups that have enough roles to um, to really get to what you want to do. You know, a smaller group of three or four may not give enough roles to do the actual role playing that you're doing. Uh, or to get to the get to the the solution of the problem depending on the roles, you know. So that's the only other thing I'll throw in there is that the, the group size can also uh, be variable depending on the specific tasks. Like, well, you didn't say that, so I actually the task that you're doing, but if there is some kind of uh, role. And I, I kind of like the idea of role playing, but again, uh, that uh, you have to be, be careful of that too, because uh, uh, some people may just not feel comfortable taking on different roles and that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, that's a really good point, on, on especially on the comfort level. The one thing that uh, you'll find, if you look through much of the literature in online learning, uh, it assumes a certain homogenous type of a population. Now, distance education had a little more diversity to it because it was initially a, and, and radio-based education, which was a thing, because that was often in remote regions in, say, parts of uh, you know, Latin America or parts of Africa where, where some of those, those uh, teaching practices were used. And so there's a little more diversity in the student population in that kind of a setting. Much of the literature, though, that you see with, with online learning, especially the literature that's developed you know, a little more in the past, mm -hmm. it required, if you were learning online quite often, you, at least if you're going through a system like Open University in UK or going through Athabasca University in Canada or, or other systems, it typically required that you um, were sort of mid-career, you uh, maybe had access to a certain level of technology. Now it's a little more ubiquitous, but that can still be a little bit of a barrier and the list goes on. So I'm just trying to emphasize that as you're beginning to do some group work activities, especially that require social roles or role playing or other things, that it's important to give uh, a good thought about what exactly is the implication for students that don't fit my sort of prototypical student, because it may be a completely different experience for someone who has a different background than what the majority of your students do. So I think there's the cultural dynamics that are important to think about as well. Uh, just looking, forums, nothing um, else for questions. I think you guys have done a good job sort of responding to the, uh, the questions as, as they arise, either via text or otherwise. So maybe as we move toward wrapping things up, I'm just going to ask a, a quick question of, of both uh, Tanya and Matt, both of you around. Uh, what are you seeing emerging over the last few months since this cycle started that you think teachers, higher ed, K-12, should be particularly aware of because it's not a short cycle? Uh, there was some hope early on that, hey, this will be done and we'll go on. And now it's becoming much more political 
uh, schools being basically told they must open, even though uh, there's conflict between what experts think should happen and what's politically expedient and so on. So if you were to look at it from the lens of today and where we were at, you know, Tanya, we went through this uh, during our last conversation, but from around interaction and the online space, what would you particularly advise teachers to focus on uh, now from the lens of today? Yeah, I think it's a little um, concerning. I wonder if I said this two weeks ago. I don't know, you know, it's Groundhog's Day, but sorry if I said this last time, but one of the things that just came up and there's like um, some group chats and some private group chats somehow on Twitter. I'm not sure how I got into those. But one of them brought up the fact that they thought they were gonna go on um, more face-to-face -face or blended in the fall and they're not, and they're going to be online. Um, I think one of the things which we want to not do is which and which I was hearing reports of is that faculty still think um, and I'm just thinking of an article this week too that was like distance learning isn't learning um, but anyways um, where <laughs> uh, in the reference to Harvard going fully online next year um, one of the things that I'm still hearing is people think that online learning is just um, an incorporation of a synchronous tool and so I think we've, um, we've expressed in the course and through our discussions, the importance of redesign. And I particularly like backwards redesign and, and rethinking your course. And as we've touched on many times, including today, is just the focus on engaging your students um, you know, with the content and with each other and creating that interaction um, and helping people develop sort of a presence um, online, a, a sort of a sense of immediacy with each other and with you as the instructor. Those are areas that I would, you know, not only for yourselves work towards, but also for your colleagues, encourage them um, to focus less on retaining um, their current face-to-face -face models with just adding a synchronous tool and to start rethinking their course. And of course, you can tell them about edX and, and to come check it out. <laughs> Any thoughts on your end, Matt? Yeah, it's, I think it's just gonna get messier and more complicated, obviously, as we move forward because uh, UTA uh, obviously had already announced plans for being some online, some hybrid, some face-to-face. -face. Uh, my son's school had already announced plans that some can be online, some could be in the classroom, parents can decide. And now we have political leaders that are coming in and saying, nah, can't do any of that. We're going to force it all open. Um, and you have differing responses from differing leaders, uh, from you know superintendents of K-12 to college presidents, universities. Um, this is kind of bleak to say this, and this was kind of a point I made in my last blog post, but um, we're getting to a place where we just can't rely on leaders for leadership. And we can't necessarily rely on leaders for decisions. They're going to make them, they're going to try to do things called leadership, but then it's just going to get all thrown out the window. So we're going to have to make plans that can be adjustable no matter what happens. And we may even have to uh, get, you know, with, with some of the schools with uh, the ICE decision to uh, not let um, uh, 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 people who don't live in the States take online lessons and they have to either, you know, enroll online or go somewhere else or what, you know, whatever their weird thing was. Um, you know, a lot of schools are now just getting into this kind of uh, craftily wording how their students are still doing the same thing, but they're just kind of rewording it and reconceptualizing it towards meets what they were going to do and the new, new changing legal requirements. And of course, we're probably going to have to do that as teachers. We're going to have to figure out ways to just do what we know to take care of our students, to take care of ourselves, to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're ultimately they're learning something but it may not be what we wanted to say maybe plan for maybe last year when we're planning out this year or whatever but we're just unfortunately going to be in it for ourselves or whoever we can get around us in smaller groups uh maybe local teachers or something like that or these online twitter discussions or whatever you know and that's kind of a bleak outlook but you may it, you know it, it may become a lot more individualistic which is not always good but it may be what we're forced into um, going forward so that's my that that's my um, bleak black mirror outlook right there. 
uh, while bleak is uh, you know understandable considering some of the challenges that exist and the uncertainty that schools face and universities face and I think to you know I'll conclude on on that note because we need to be aware that ourselves, our colleagues, the students in our classrooms, the parents of students, especially younger population in in the classrooms in the K to twelve system, they're facing a lot of fear, anxiety, uncertainty, and and it's not uh, by any means the traditional set of concerns that they're facing, which means at some level, some degree of uh, you know, tolerance and awareness for the mental health and anxiety conditions that peers, students, their parents face, I think needs to be sort of a front and center consideration in the activities that we do, the assignments that we expect students to complete, and uh, the nature of engagement that we're willing to, to have. So for example, with a current group that was just wrapping up in, in fall, or not in fall, spring, um, I had a group of students toward the end that uh, there was all kinds of special requests for assignments, submissions, for di for variations, for adjustments, and so on. And I, I opened that a little bit by saying, you know, if there's something that's needed, just let me know. Now, there's always the prospect that someone who just was a little lazy and didn't complete it on time, and they should have, they have no real excuse to not have it done, that uh, that they sort of take advantage of someone being flexible. But that's such a a small insignificant part of your student population that you, you want to create humane kind policies that benefit everyone even if you may have a student or two that takes advantage of it i think that that's an irrelevant rounding error compared to the the fact to have a, an attitude of consideration towards the experience of others final thoughts tanya matt before we wrap up yeah i I have no final thoughts, except that's really um, a good point. I feel like there's so many things to remember. But yeah, we were talking, uh, Michelle and I were privately about due dates. And I think that it's really important this, um, this coming term when, you know, again, this is like such a new reality that we're living in. And, um, you know, today I just was having a discussion with, you know, somebody about, you know, having children at home and trying to work. And, um, you know, and several people I know are sick right now. And it's just like, you know, sometimes you're just like, and work isn't going to happen right now because um, there's other things that are going on. And I think just remember that that's going to be happening in your students' lives as well. So I think that was a great point, George, on just being humane. Um, you know, I don't like to miss deadlines or any of those sorts of things. And, um, but, you know, sometimes that's just not important. <laughs> in the greater scheme of uh, what's going on right now. So just, um, yeah, be lenient with students on, on those sorts of things. That's a good point. Yeah, I get requests for extensions or uh, repeats or whatever, different things. I just go ahead and grant them. I don't ask for proof. I don't ask for doctor's notes. I don't ask for anything. You know, they say they, say they need it, uh, you know, and you know, I've already had several students with coronavirus already, but uh, it doesn't even have to be coronavirus related. Uh, there are just, uh, this affects so many other people in so many different ways, you know? And so I just, they need it. I try to provide it as much as possible. Unfortunately, there are school deadlines that I have to abide by, you know, uh, grade, you know, submission deadlines and those kind of things. And I let, I let them know from the very beginning that I have to follow those. But other than that, I try to be as flexible as I can with everything else. And, go with it, see where it goes. Do a lot of uh, incompletes as well too, and then working with them after the deadlines as well. So the, the class isn't necessarily in once the due dates, <laughs> uh, the, the last day comes. Yeah, great point uh, there. And, and I, it's odd in a way that it takes a crisis to foreground the importance of kindness in classrooms uh, and, and being a bit of a smart ass with that statement because I know educators generally do try to focus on it but uh, yeah it's important that we keep that front and center all right well thanks uh, all for your questions and uh, thanks Matt and Tanya for for taking the time to join in on the conversation I hope everybody has a great rest of the week uh, continue throwing your questions in the discussion forums and I think we'll be back with one of these sessions uh, well, I'd have to check the schedule but either next week or the week after. So take care all.